We do welcome you here this morning as we prepare to open up the Word of God and uh, see what the Lord's given us today. I am always appreciate and excited that God gave us a book Amen. that we could sit down and look at, and it was always timely, it was always on time, and it was nothing but a book of truth and full of truth, and uh, that we can be secure in knowing that God's given us His Word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8 again today as we uh, pick up here on the Scriptures as we begin uh, again in the book of Acts. Each week I like to have a little quote from a famous preacher or a famous quote anyway to help constantly educate us a little on those that went before us, to honor them, those that went before us, and to see kind of how did they think? <laughs> how did they think? Uh, this is Lesson 39. Anybody tell me who that is? You probably, some people know that one. That's right. Somebody said it. Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill. Now here is one of his quotes. Revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented that He shows up Himself. <laughs> Be encouraged. <laughs> the time is good. <laughs> the time is good. <laughs> Be encouraged. That's right. Uh, it's obvious that Leonard uh, did not give up on God. <laughs> Looks like he. I kind of questioned, though, if he gave up on man or not, but I always liked that uh, quote of Leonard Ravenhill. Love to read his stuff. There you can actually get some old uh, copies of his teachings online. And, of course, basically what we have of Leonard Ravenhill today is as he was older, uh, in the latter years of his life, and I, I, it was amazing to me how a lot of those guys, especially Leonard, he was no nonsense. And I thought, well, I'd like to have seen how he was earlier. And I read some of his stuff, and I thought he didn't just get that way. He's always been that way, <laughs> a, no, a no nonsense type of guy. Here's Leonard Ravenhill, was a British Christian evangelist and author who focused on the subjects of prayer and revival. Born in 1907 in the United Kingdom. And he died in 1904 at the ripe old age of 87 years old. That's Leonard Ravenhill. If you ever want to get some incredible preaching, uh, he is a good one. I listen to him on podcast and things through the day. All right, we'll pick up here on Acts chapter 8. We're going to uh, start off here with verse 26. If you're uh, in your uh, Bibles, this is Philip and the, the Ethiopian. We begin our discussion and our Bible study last week here with this scripture of, the, of Philip and the Ethiopian. And we, we had an introduction to what was happening here. And, and my hopes is with this Bible study here on Sunday mornings that there, uh, you're being able to retain some of these things that we're discussing on this expository type Bible teaching. This is where we do line upon line. It's not topical. I just hit the next topic that's in the verse. And the t it, and, but we're doing line upon line so we, we'll understand some of the, the way the Bible is put together and constructed. But this is talking about Philip uh, and the uh, Ethiopian. Now, what was amazing to me about this story was here you have Philip and then all of a sudden you've got this eunuch uh, beside the road here. And here is the scripture in Acts 28, 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza. We started there, discussed it a little bit last week, which is in the desert. So Philip here has been spoken to uh, to go uh, down from Jerusalem into the Gaza. Now, what, here is actually kind of the little, uh, he, he was in Jerusalem, then he will find that he goes up to Samaria, and then he gets the instruction while he's in Samaria, many are healed. Uh, we went over the story of uh, Simon, 
you know, he wanted the power of God. We went over that story like a few weeks ago. Peter and John were excited about what was going on uh, in Samaria, so they went up to check it out. Um, then the, the, uh, the return uh, was after they admonished uh, Simon. And then Philip comes down and he's sent back to Jerusalem, right there, the little red dot. So he was, uh, he was at uh, Samaria. He came uh, back to Jerusalem. Then we'll pick it up here where he was on, uh, uh, he was to go to Gaza via the Gaza Road. Has anybody heard of Gaza lately in the news? Uh, right there. Uh, and I'm sure some would have loved to have had the same escort as Philip had and got translated, but out of Gaza. So he went from there on his way down uh, towards Gaza. And here Philip meets the Ethiopian treasurer. So that's kind of, but now the reason that little trek there is important, you had the stoning of Stephen, which kind of flushed Philip out, kind of flushed him out of Jerusalem. Uh, you had the stoning of Stephen, and you, you, the leaders, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem at the stoning of Stephen, the goal was to run the Christians out of town. That was the goal of the stoning of Stephen. And it was pretty effective, I might add. And uh, so we had Philip, uh, he goes up and Philip starts this little missionary journey, if you will. And of course, now you've got to understand what Philip's preaching. Philip is preaching what Philip heard there in Acts 2, that Jesus is the Son of God, that if you'll repent that God's going to send him again quickly. They, they thought it would be any day. So Philip's going up and down that little missionary journey there. He's preaching this gospel that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When then we'll see here how that Philip is translated uh, to Astus and walks to Caesarea. So you see where the little red uh, bottom line there is. He's, on, he's going towards Gaza. And then he meets the, the uh, Ethiopian uh, eunuch, my, uh, and then he, is, he baptizes him, right? And we're going to go over that. And then he's translated. In other words, God, all of a sudden he disappears, and God, by the click of your fingers, God moves him up to Astus there. And uh, it just so happens that he had to walk from uh, Astus then, uh, right there. He was translated. But then he had to go up to Caesarea, but he, God didn't translate him there. He had to hoof it. And, and one of the reasons is, it's in that last part of the journey that he gave the gospel message again, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But for some reason down along Gaza, down through there, and I, I, I didn't dig in it too deep, but for some reason uh, he translated him from f baptizing the eunuch uh, he translated him because uh, the only thing I can come up with, for some reason, he didn't want him preaching his message uh, from there to Astra. I mean, or, or maybe he was running behind schedule. I mean, who knows? And so God had to zip him up there. But nonetheless, that's kind of the layout of this story of Philip and uh, the eunuch here. So as we go into verse 27, And he arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candence, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in the chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Okay, do you get that? You kind of get that in your. So he arose, he went, he met a man from Ethiopia. He was a eunuch, great authority, under Candence, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure. So this wasn't any everyday uh, eunuch, right? Now the, the eunuch there, uh, it was considered, uh, we're probably three or four hundred years uh, in history, the eunuch here had progressed into a, a person of great honor, a person that could be trusted. So this eunuch could be trusted with all of the treasure of, of the queen. So he must have been a well-respected man, and I'm sure he didn't have all the treasures with him, but it wouldn't be just a man. It would be a man with an entourage of people. He was, a, he was the most important man of the queen, and for some reason 
he had been given instructions to go to Jerusalem. And here we're catching him on the way out of Jerusalem. And he's sitting there bewildered reading Isaiah. And it's like, it's like he missed something. He was saying, he, w he was sent by the queen, he goes to Jerusalem and he, he worships, it says. And, um, and so then he leaves and he's, and on his way out, he's sitting there reading the book of Isaiah saying, what? Something's not adding up. Keep that in mind as we progress here. Why was he reading Isaiah? It seems that he was confused. So he was a great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. <clears throat> Probably under the same line of the queen of Sheba. You remember that story uh, of Ethiopia. Uh, this is an Ethiopian caravan with treasure of all of the treasure of the queen of Ethiopia, which the Ethiopian eunuch heard that the Messiah had come, but now had been crucified. He was then confused, so therefore Philip told him what was taking place concerning the Messiah. So the reason he was confused, he went to Jerusalem to see the Messiah. When he gets there, the Messiah had been crucified. He was confused. All right, then you have to start asking yourself the question, okay, why did he go see the Messiah? What was his business? What was his purpose on being there? And there is a possibility for that. And I started speaking about that last week. And so he went to Jerusalem, we see, and he went there to worship. Now for a eunuch to worship in Jerusalem uh, especially was a little uncommon. But for some reason, we know that he had this uh, particular privilege. Now, Ethiopian tradition believed that they were to return the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem at the return of the Messiah. Now, as I got into that tradition uh, last week somewhat, some believe that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia today. And uh, I had the privilege of knowing uh, 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 an archaeologist, and uh, they called him an Indiana Jones site, Bob Cranook. I knew Bob Cranook, and I saw him 30 days after he got back from Ethiopia on a trip. Uh, he was trying to discover if that was the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. And he'd went there, he came, stayed at the house, this, about a month out or so of him getting back. And of course, he was so excited. Uh, of what he had discovered, and he believes that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. And of course, the story goes, and I'm going to go over the story. Some of you know it, some of you don't, perhaps, but then maybe I can give you a little information to help you tie it together here today. Uh, it's called the Menelik legend was that Queen of Sheba, and we know this has happened, uh, visited Solomon, and uh, she was leaving to go home. Solomon slept with her, and she became pregnant. Then, when at home, she gave birth to a son named Menelik. The story goes that, uh, I said zero to 19 because we don't really know. He returned to Jerusalem. Some tradition has it he never left Jerusalem, that she had him, and she left him there with Solomon until he was 19. Others say, no, she became pregnant. In Ethiopia, they say she became pregnant. They're not even sure if Solomon knew it. And she went back home, had Menelik in Ethiopia, and then she raised him. It, it, is, it is believed that the Queen of Sheba converted, that she was, she was a Jew when she left uh, Solomon. She was so taken with him that she was uh, converted, if you will. And, of course, you know the story. Uh, I, I personally believe, I say this kind of as, as a joke, but I, 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 don't, I don't think it's a joke at all, but we know Solomon wrote the book of Solomon, and I believe he, he, of course, he wrote the Song of Solomon to the Queen of Sheba, I believe. And then when she left him, he wrote, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And he, he's, you think about it, and it'll, it fits. So, uh, if, you know, the Ethiopian tradition uh, believes that they have the Ark uh, now in a building in Aksum, Ethiopia. It is also known, uh, it is also in the constitution of Ethiopia. Now, can you believe this? The story of the Queen of Sheba having the son of Solomon is in the constitution of this country. 
as 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 their uh, solomatic uh, is what's called a solomatic tradition bloodline. So they believe that they are uh, Levites. So you, they they're actually were Levite Jews with the Queen of Sheba. When the eunuch came back with the message that he's been crucified, but he's been raised from the dead, given to him by Philip, when he went back to the country, then to the new queen, then they became Christian. You see, the eunuch's message to the queen converted these Levite Jews into Christian Levite Jews. So now you've got a different group of believers in Ethiopia today. They believe themselves to be Levite, Jews, and that Jesus is the Messiah. And they believe the gospel message. And they, uh, it's also believed, and I'll show you a little picture or two of it, that in Acts and there with this group of, and they basically, they're, they're basically Orthodox Jewish Christians. It is, it, is, uh, it is a different. Now, the one reason they're Levites is they believe they have the Ark of the Covenant. Story goes that uh, Menelik brought the Ark of the Covenant <coughs> down to Ethiopia, up to Axum. And I'll, I'll take us through this little uh, tradition here. Now, their guardianship is a commitment of the government and the Christian church. The Ethiopians are now Christian. Now there's the building that they claim houses the Ark of the Covenant. Now it just so happens that you can't go in that building. There's just a man that goes, there's one man who is, is a fence around it. Uh, like I said, Bob, Bob Cranook had been there. There is a man uh, that looks after the man that's inside. That's the guy inside. He's the guy that supposedly looks after the ark. Uh, when he dies, the man that looks after that man then takes his place, which is usually a kind of pretty young guy. And then he stays in, they never leave that fence as long as they live. Their job is to take care of the ark of the covenant. And uh, do I believe that it's there or not? I personally believe it probably is, but it's just because, probably because I got the other end of Bob Cranook right when he came back and he said, there's no doubt in his mind. Uh, because he talked with the guy that looks after that guy. And he said what convinced him was that that old man told him that the mercy seat, that the Ark of the Covenant, he told him, he says, not like you think it is. The top, the mercy seat, when it was the lid that goes on the Ark of the Covenant. He said that lid is hammered gold, which the Bible says. <clears throat> but he said that there are two angels, but he said that the, the seat is hammered gold and it comes out and it looks like two angel wings. And he said it looks like two wings down each side and like two angels are touching hands at the back. So it's like this. And so he said, it looks like a seat somewhere where somebody would sit and it's just hammered out, but it's that solid gold. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, is wood uh, covered in uh, gold. <clears throat> but the, the mercy seat, he kept emphasizing, but the mercy seat is a separate piece from the Ark, but even though it's part of the Ark. And, uh, and he told him their job was when the Messiah comes back to Jerusalem, they're to take the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. So therefore we understand why the eunuch went. You see, they'd had it for 2,400 years before then. This is when the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant left the Temple of Solomon is how long they've had it. Well, it was on a journey down to Ethiopia, but that's how long that it, I think that 2,000 years or something like that. So, the, so here we're seeing this Ethiopian eunuch. He goes to Jerusalem. Well, no doubt he's going to see if the, if the Messiah is there. Why? Because if he is, they're supposed to take the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. He goes there, and he's been crucified. So he's like, how can this be? So God had Philip come to where the eunuch was, 
and gave him understanding of what he was reading in Isaiah. The eunuch said, gave him, he gave him understanding. No doubt the Holy Ghost set up the eunuch and Philip. But we see that the eunuch got the gospel message through Philip. He takes it back to Ethiopia. Now, the, I like it the way God, there Philip technically converted a whole nation in a day, right? <laughs> By telling the eunuch. The eunuch totally received this message, converted a nation in a day because he went. So Philip had done his job, so God just took him out of the way. Philip couldn't even get an encore from the eunuch, <laughs> right? So if, if that tells you anything about take, being a messenger of God, uh, don't stay around for an encore and tell you how smart you are and pretty you are. Get out of Dodge, right? We leave the Word of God and we're gone. Because it's not about us. Now this message was so big and so heavy that God translated Philip out of there. And I think it was not so much, I kid about it somewhat, but I believe it was because God wanted to get him out of Dodge so that he didn't add anything to the message. It was just the message. And that's all the eunuch needed. And so I believe that's what was happening and why this story is even put in the scriptures here. It is a big deal. Now we know there's other scripture. I'll give a little scripture here and let me, then I'll move on. We'll get into that thought. <clears throat> here we see, why was this Ethiopian eunuch encountered in the Bible? One possibility was because of the relationship between the Queen of Sheba and Solomon. When the Queen of Sheba visited King Solomon about 950 BC, <clears throat> she was awed by his wealth, power, and wisdom. Sheba had a country of commercial importance. It, now look at this. It was 1,500 miles south of Jerusalem. That's a pretty good trip just to go see a wise man, don't you think? The origin of the Ethiopian Jews is unclear, though most believe they are descendants of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The biblical account was in that she came there, and I've got the other verse in this next one, but uh, that's just a little famous uh, painting of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. Now, in Second Chronicles, let's see where this is uh, spoken about. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame on Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem and a very good company and camels and bare spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart, and Solomon told her all her questions. There was nothing hid from Solomon, which he told her not. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the meat of his table, the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, his cupbearers, and also their apparel, and his uh, ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more uh, spirit in her. It's again in Second Chronicles. And she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in mine own land of uh, your acts and of your wisdom. Howbeit I believed not their words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told to me. For thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee in hearty wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne to be king for the Lord thy God. Because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever, therefore made he the king over them to do judgment and justice. I think it'd be fair to say she got swooped. I think she got smitten and she got swooped. But you also can see she was here being converted, even in this very scripture is, is prophetically telling us that she was becoming converted because of the life of, of Solomon. <laughs> There's another famous picture uh, of her. Now, the Menelik legend is, I say legend because it's, uh, I'm not pulling this from the Bible. I'm pulling this from the uh, 
from the idea of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon having a son uh, named Menelik. Now, all of that is historically accurate, <laughs> but nonetheless not in the Bible. The Queen of Sheba visited Solomon in those days, Ethiopia included Saudi Arabia. So the Queen of Sheba was Ethiopian. Now, it just so happens the way she became queen, her brother was supposed to be king, and he died of, all of a sudden something happened, he died, and um, I'm, I hate to say it, but it was in the plan of God, I'm sure, because God wanted her to move in uh, to be queen here. <laughs> so she uh, ended up being the queen of Ethiopia. They had a son, Menelik, who grew up there until he was 19. He then returned to Ethiopia, and he brought with him the Ark of the Covenant, leaving behind a replica. Now, you can do your historical studies there. You can say, well, why did he bring the Ark back if that is what happened? And because of all of the warring and all this, there was reasons for that. They apparently have been uh, guarding this object now for 2,400 years. So that's a pretty long time. And, and it actually took, now listen to this, it took about six or seven hundred years to transport it down there. there. About every hundred years it would move another 300 miles or something. Then it'd stay there for a hundred years. And then, I mean, it's, you can, it's just, the whole story of that is absolutely amazing. If, if anybody enjoys history, how it got there. The legend has been included in their constitution, which is amazing. It served to be ascribed as Solomatic descent for the uh, early Ethiopian kings. <clears throat> that descent, they had this bloodline stayed established until 1974. I think if I'd have done it that long, I'd have just kept it going, but uh, there's reasons why that didn't happen. Uh, the Menelik legend, uh, as it continued, <clears throat> there was a 2400 year history of a sacred relic guarded by the Ethiopia. <clears throat> from its time. All right, it went from Elephantine, Elephantine Island in Upper Egypt from 642 B.C. Now this is like a hundred so many years apart. Then it went to this other island at 470 B.C. And then it went from there to its present location at uh, Axum, uh, protected until they can deliver it to the Messiah when He rules at Mount Zion. Isaiah 18 is the reference. So in their minds, they're protecting the Ark of the Covenant when the Messiah returns and they're to take the Ark back. Uh, now the news in the part that we know, and, and the tradition is that Jesus will use that mercy seat to sit upon, which would biblically make total sense to me. Uh, that's where they put the sacrifice, the blood and all, but now Jesus is that ultimate. So it all uh, makes sense in, in that uh, respect. Now, could this have been the reason the Ethiopian eunuch was at Jerusalem and was leaving confused? Again, all right, let's read it. Let's read it one more time. In Acts 27, he arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, uh, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading Isaiah the prophet. Okay, here, here's the trek of uh, where the ark would have, it went from Jerusalem down to Elatine Island, uh, down to Tanya, uh, I can't say that word, uh, then down to the church of Mary of Zion there in Axis. And that's another picture of the actual building that they claim it is in today. If you want to read a book on it, or also you can get the video, uh, that's Bob Kernuk's search for the Ark of the Covenant. If you'd like to write that down or take a picture of that screen, if you'd like to follow up a little bit of interesting. <clears throat> uh, I know what's in there all happened because I know that man. Uh, so that's the search for the Ark of the Covenant, Bob Knut. Now, <clears throat> the celebration of the birth of Jesus and the celebration of the Ark of the Covenant in Askham. So today, once a year in Askham, they have this big celebration of the Ark of the Covenant. All over Askham is a, um, these Orthodox Christian churches just ever, peppered everywhere. It's worse than, than Alexander County and our independent Baptist churches everywhere. It, they got these churches everywhere, and they all have a relic or, or replica of the Ark of the Covenant because they're known, we are the city of the Ark of the Covenant. So 
So the Ark of the Covenant's a big deal to them. They think that's what their commission is, their call is. But they're very, very strong uh, believers, Christian believers. And, but they have, um, actually the oldest Bible in the world is believed to be in Ethiopia. It was, it was done by them. And uh, so, but they have this celebration every year, and they take the replica of the Ark of the Covenant down to the water, down to the river. Now, in, now what they're celebrating <clears throat> is the ultimate, they're celebrating, you got to read their history on why they do it this way, but they're celebrating the baptism of Jesus. But they, yet they take this replica of the Ark of the Covenant down to the water, but they're celebrating the baptism of Jesus, and then uh, that He is the sacrifice of all sin. They're celebrating that, and then they, uh, they, and they know that the mercy seat is the throne seat, that's what they believe, of the Messiah when He comes back to Jerusalem. You know. So they have this celebration, I just uh, got a few pictures from what's going on during these celebrations. Most of them they wrap in white, they're very orthodox, their priests and stuff have the hey, all got this orthodox stuff that they've made over you know the years. Uh, that's just some of the of the crowd that they have there. This is this is everything in Ethiopia uh, and in that part of the world. There's the, some of the priests of the orthodox priest. <coughs> there, that is what they think is the actually oldest Bible in the world. Um, and they have it there, and uh, it is. It has all of these uh, pictures in it, plus the uh, right there is the what it looks like. There it is, another one lay, leaning up against there. It's the old what they what's considered by all scholars uh, probably the oldest Bible in the world. All right, let's go to verse twenty-nine here quickly. Uh, then the Spirit said unto Philip. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Okay. He says, all right, now I want you to go. I want you to join yourself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. So he goes to the chariot. He hears him reading it out loud. He's reading from Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? <laughs> he said, are you understanding what you're reading? And he said, here's what he said. Here's what the eunuch said. Well, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So the eunuch was saying, I, a little bit maybe like, what do you mean do I understand? Somebody's got to tell me what's going on. It's the reason I stopped on the side of the road and I'm reading it. I don't understand what's happening. So Philip uh, came and he sat with him. Now the guide here is considered a teacher or somebody with authority. So the eunuch was looking for somebody with authority. Now they were actually reading Isaiah 52 and 53. Now the Holy Spirit is obvious had prepared the eunuch and Philip for this encounter with destiny. It was two men came together. Two men were carrying the message to change a nation and change a world. Two men. Took two. The Holy Spirit prepared both of them. We're living at the end of this age. The Holy Spirit's prepared all of us. It don't take but one or two of us. If we engage with the truth of God for this, for this time. Two men. So here we go. He said, I needed a man that should guide me, he said. Now, it goes on. It says, the place of the Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Now, the eunuch was wanting some understanding. And like a lamb dumb before the shears, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare this generation for his life is taken from the earth? See, the eunuch didn't understand. It's Isaiah 53 goes on to say, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You know, Philip was just jumping at the, he, he said, okay, come on, get to it, get to it. Philip was waiting for this opportunity. <clears throat> and as they went on their way, 
they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. Isn't that amazing? He was baptized. He said, yes, I believe. So the eunuch was in dismay. He, he, he didn't know what was happening. He went to Jerusalem to see the Messiah. He found out the Messiah had been crucified. He was going back home and saying, the one we've been waiting for has been killed. But yet God had him arrested in the road there. Sent Philip down at the right time to see him and to meet him to give him the gospel message. Now that tells us how God sends his gospel message. When you run into somebody and the Holy Spirit says, give him the message, it's not by happen chance that that happened. God has probably been orchestrating you. There's been times that Tim Parsons drove a truck up north and God's orchestrated him at a time to be at a truck stop at a certain time to give somebody the gospel. Is that the truth, Tim? Absolutely. I know it for a fact that God would manipulate him coming back on a truck, 18-wheeler, long haul. And the reason I say that about Tim, he says it's happened hundreds of times. I know it for a fact. If you've ever been in a rest area or to a restaurant up and down these major highways today, and you see a little chick track, that man over there littered the highways with him. That's what he did. I'm not blowing the trumpet at Tim. I'm just saying these encounters happen. They happen. And we're to give the gospel message. When the encounter comes, it changed the nation. He got the truth. Now let's go on here. This is the beginning of Christianity in Ethiopia, in the Ethiopian Christian church. And you see, you've got this whole aspect of Christianity that basically we don't know anything about going on in Ethiopia today. It's a little different than our southern style, right? It's a little, I doubt if they sing Amazing Grace, but it's, but it's a, we have a different culture. That is a totally different culture. But do they have the truth? Not only do they have the truth, it's obvious God's using them in a mighty way. Now let's go on here in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip. There he goes. Bye-bye, Philip. That the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Asdus, and passing through, he preached in all of the cities till he came to Caesarea. Do you get a little more of a mental picture of what was going on here with Philip and the eunuch and the translation of Philip? So I've had a person two weeks ago ask me, well, Alan, could, uh, could somebody be translated today? The only thing I can tell you is, well, I'd have to say yes if God chose that because I have a New Testament example of where God did that. So if God did that then, do I think God can do that now? God can do anything He wants to. I don't know if you know, but He's in charge. God is in charge. So nonetheless, we see this, uh, this happening here. And Philip uh, was translated, as we see. Uh, here we find the eunuch was very happy as the Scriptures were re realized in his life at that very moment. So that's where I say the eunuch was a happy man. He had the truth. No doubt he went back to the queen and told her the time was not yet. And so what happened? Why was the time not yet? Because God had a secret. He had a mystery. Ephesians chapter 3. That there was going to be a time of the Gentiles. There was going to be, he was going to create this thing called the church that was not before told. And there's going to be neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male or female. He said, I'm doing a body 
It's called the bride of Christ. So we find ourselves sitting here as the bride of Christ in this interim time of this mystery of the secret that the eunuch and Philip, they didn't know about. They were looking for the Messiah to come again right then. But we're living in a 2,000 year period of a secret. And the secret is we have been saved by the grace of God. Nothing that we have contributed. We just receive the truth. We receive this message of the truth and you shall be saved. Amen. So we see that the Lord caught Philip away here. And then uh, the eunuch, it says, uh, he went on rejoicing. <clears throat> now there again, this is the same chart we had a minute ago where he started, uh, Philip who started, went up to Samaria, many were healed. Here's the same story. He returned after Simon. Then we see where Philip was sent back to Jerusalem. Then he went to Gaza. There's where he met uh, the eunuch. And he met, met the eunuch there. <clears throat> and then he is translated up to there. He baptized him somewhere around Gaza down through there. Then he was translated up to Astus. And then he had to walk it. <clears throat> then he had to walk it up to Caesarea to give the gospel message as he, as he went. Uh, in Acts 8, 39, it says, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught him away. Uh, I'm sorry, I went back to the same one. <clears throat> I hit the wrong button. Now. So now that is the end of the book of Acts, uh, chapter 8, where the eunuch... Uh, got his information straight where he found out that Jesus was the Messiah. And then he took that gospel Christian message down uh, to Ethiopia. Now, interesting. Now we're going to start in to chapter nine. What happens in chapter nine? We see the conversion of Saul and the name change of Paul. Now, everything to this point, and it start, I want you to start understanding what's happening. Up until this point, you have Jesus and the 12 disciples. <clears throat> we know Judas was replaced with Matthias. Why? Because Jesus says, and it happens in the book of Revelation, that Jesus will be in Jerusalem when he comes back again. Jesus will be there. And also, believe it or not, the 12 disciples, when Jesus comes back, sets up the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand year reign, the 12 disciples will be there with Jesus in Jerusalem ruling. Now that, that is the, the Messianic kingdom prophesied about Old Testament all the way up into the first four books of the New Testament. But you've got to understand you had to have one member of each of the 12 tribes with Jesus because they are going to rule and judge Israel plus the world. So they had to have 12. Now, here's the problem. When Paul comes on the scene, or Saul, which we're fixing to get into in this next week, in chapter 9, when Saul came on the scene, he was known as an apostle. The problem is, he was number 13. Well, Jesus didn't need 13 apostles. He just needed 12 apostles. So we see a transition happening again, the book of Acts again, it's the reason we call it a transitional book. And then we see that Peter, and we'll get into it, where Peter and Paul had a discussion, kind of a heated discussion, if you will. They decided, Peter said, well, listen, we'll go to the Jews and Paul, you go to the Gentiles. Peter actually is, was given the issue, the keys of the kingdom and whatever Peter bound on earth was bound in heaven. So Peter made all of these decisions with the authority of the keys of the kingdom. One of those decisions was that Peter and the 12 would go to Israel and Paul would go to the Gentiles. Then I'm going to show you that happened. Then there's a bigger, it's another transition as it keeps going. Then we know we get to the end of the book of Acts 
a lot of and most of uh, the disciples, a lot of them had been martyred and they were fixing to be martyred. And we see that Paul comes on the scene and he starts writing these letters to the churches. Now, you tie in the letters of Paul's writing to the churches and the churches of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You know the seven churches there? So we've got these churches up and running. God brings in the apostle Paul. Actually, it was Saul. God got converted him and then changed his name to Paul. And I've taught you in times past, anytime you see a name change, you know God's change. He's, he's given us, I don't like to say God's changing something. God's given us more information to work with. So all of a sudden, we've got this 13th apostle. Don't need but 12. We've got 13. And the reason is, Paul said, listen, I'll be the apostle of the Gentiles. And so then we're, we start running into this time of the apostle and to the Gentiles. Now, you, please remember this. One does not include two, but two includes one. One and two doesn't include three, but three includes one and two. Now what I mean by that, the time of the Gentiles, which I'm calling us three, includes one and two. It includes everything that the Scripture said to the nation Israel. It's included to us. Plus some more understanding. God had a secret. He had a message. It was a secret. And we're going to get into that mystery more. And under, so we can just understand why did it, what happened? What, how did we evolve to here? Honestly and truly, it's not, it's very easy. And once you see it, you'll, you'll, your expectancy and your, your relying on the scriptures will heighten a hundred and a hundred and a thousand times over. You'll see how perfect this book is and what God has done. And I'll tell you this much, a church today, I know everybody says it's in trouble and all, and I get all that. But this much I'll tell you, the church is exactly where this book says it would be. That's where it's at. So I'm not too worried we're running behind schedule or we're losing ground or, or I know we say, well, it's, it looks like we're going to hell in the handbag. I get all that. But I've read the book's my problem. I've read the book. We are more than conquerors. We are going to come out on the top of this thing. You can come out on top of this incredibly evil world that we're in. You'll live through it, believe it or not. But there's one thing to live through it, and there's another to live through it victorious. And I'm going to bring a message here in the next few weeks to this church on the difference of of being sinful and being evil. And I'll tell you this much. All sin is not evil. But all evil is sin. And I'm going to try to bring some understanding to this evil world that we're in. But I'll, I'll tell you this. Sin unconfessed will evolve into evil. Why does God want us to confess sin? So that we don't turn evil. Let me tell you this. I got to hush. Jesus ate with sinners. But Jesus did not eat with evil people. You got to make a distinction in a sinner from something that's evil. Well, that's enough of that. You'll have to come back a couple weeks to get that message. Let's stand. I'm out of time. I hope you've learned something this morning. The, the, the deal is, though, that you'll be like Bereans, that you'll study the Scriptures. The only way I can stand up here and teach and preach is because I'm trusting that you're testing what I'm saying. 
If you don't understand it, you'll test it. If you'll test it and I'm wrong, tell me. I'll make this confession. I, it just comes as the Holy Ghost, I'm sure. Uh, last week or two, I do this thing of 2,000 years, 2,000 years. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I said from, from Noah to, to Abraham, 2,000 years. It was from Genesis to Abraham. But I got hung up on Noah because that was a changing of an age. I went back. I quoted incorrectly. Forgive me. So therefore, you need to test what I'm saying. Go to the Scriptures. Be sure these things that I'm saying are true. And it's with that deal that I can stand up here with all boldness and preach, knowing that you have the final say, the final word between you and the Holy Spirit. Well, let's do go to the Lord, to the Lord in prayer. I'm expecting a supernatural Sunday. I'm expecting that we've all come here today and that our God in heaven, our God in heaven, would issue supernatural things to this congregation, to those that are watching online. So if you'll agree with me, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this day. I do ask and pray, oh God, that you'd forgive us of all of our sin that we've done this day, up to this day. And but Lord, we're asking and praying for an invasion. We've asked for it before, we'll ask for it again. And Lord, we just pray you'll give it up because we're going to keep asking for it. For of an invasion from heaven that would confound the wise, it would, it would totally comfort the confused, and it'd bring healing to the sick. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Teach us to worship you is our prayer. Amen and amen.